The Sicilians came over here with no animosity to African Americans. My dad started telling me how to handle when someone calls you a Dago. If you were in line to buy, a, you know, rice or whatever at their grocery store, you were in line. And white people would come in saying, well, I get to get in front of the black person. And the Italians would say, no, you don't. At this issue, in my opinion, it called for a formal apology. On March 14, 1891, 11 Italians were made the victims of a lynch mob on the street right here in the city of New Orleans. The city government at that time declined to seek justice for our people. And in fact, was implicated in the violence. That's why I'm here, and that's why I'm standing. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right. Hey, Danielle, it's great to be on your show. My name is Charles Gino Marsala. I'm from New Orleans. I went out to California and ended up becoming mayor of Atherton, California in 2006. And then I came back to Louisiana, and I'm currently the president of the American Italian Federation of the Southeast. And I, I decided that I wanted to tell our story. So I have a show on PBS here locally at nine o'clock called Celebrating Culture. And we've been doing a lot of documentaries about the Italian migration into Louisiana. Amazing. I Your channel is so professional. And I'm going to send people over there and I'll link to it. But if you want to see his channel, it's just AWE News at YouTube, but I'll, I'll link to it. I'm amazed by how professional <laughs> and they should only give me some tips because <laughs> I feel like you just go out there and talk to people and that's so, it looks so easy for you. And, and the cameraman, uh, who's actually my production manager and it really, a lot of credit goes to Joey Harmon. He does phenomenal editing sound. He does everything. And we've been nominated for three Emmys and it's only him and I. So it's really amazing we, how we're doing this. <laughs> Well, I know how much work it is, so I can see like the effort. It's so high quality. I, I I think really what is striking me is that you care about this so much because this is your family story. So you said you were born in New Orleans. Tell me, I don't want this to really get out, but I haven't been to New Orleans yet. <laughs> I've been to Louisiana, but not New Orleans. Tell me what it was like growing up as an Italian-American boy in New Orleans. You know, it was interesting because... Um, a little bit sheltered. We we lived. We moved when I was about seven outside of the metropolitan area to a new area of swamp that was just drained. So I'm not kind of isolated there. But then as I got older, my dad started telling me how to handle when someone calls you a dago. You know, he actually said that that, that word translates into meaning strong, good looking, hardworking young man. So that was how. Whenever I heard that word, that's what I thought they were really telling me. Okay. <laughs> That's a, that's a good dad. That's a good that's dad. Great dad. So what was your experience as a kid versus maybe your dad's? Was he also born in New Orleans or where, he, where was he, he from? He was born in Monroe. Yeah. And, you know, I'm fourth generation here. And oddly enough, there was a little Sicily, a little Italy in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, my dad married an Italian Sicilian girl in Monroe. And then they moved to New Orleans right before I was born. So we, I went back and forth to Monroe a lot during growing up with St. Joseph Alter's weddings, they have like 300 cousins there. And then in 1960s, they bulldozed Little Italy and made that neighborhood into the Civic Center. So I realized that the Civic Center story was, I mean, the Little Italy story was lost and that I could tell the story so that my younger cousins would would know what our ancestors did. And there's, an, there's a cemetery there with the cities in Sicily where all of these Italians came from. And it's right in downtown Monroe. It's, a, it's an amazing little story. And the funny thing was they did win the state basketball title for single A in 1960. There were 10 Italians on the team and one non-Italian, but they were called the Fighting Irish. <laughs> oh, that's really, how I, I'm i surprised that they were uh, going along with it. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Um, it's amazing. So I... When I started researching the Louisiana side, I did not expect to run into my dad's family story. Like my dad's side, you know, Southern Italian. My mom says Louisiana. And imagine my shock researching and, and being like, first of all, uh, I grew up with the identity of being Italian American. Never heard of any of this stuff, first of all. But to find it there in Louisiana, and I'm talking about the massacre of, you know, the, the when I want to get to that because you've covered that so much. Did you grow up knowing about the history of the Italian experience in New Orleans? Or how did you even come to find out about that stuff? 
So one of the, the telling points is to me is as I got to senior in high school, I had a really good friend who was not Italian. And we had been best friends for like four years. And then I think it was our first year at college. I go to pick him up at his house. And his mother says, where are you boys going? And, you know, and she's I've, I've had meals there and everything else. And, and he says, uh, Mom, we're going to escort some debutantes to the, the debutante thing is big in New Orleans. And there must be two or three hundred of these parties as the girls turn 18 that they have a, a, a coming out party, so to speak. And, and she looks with all not to insult me, but in all honesty, looks at Mike and says, Mike, they don't let Italians do those things. <laughs> so those are some of the little things that I, I learned. And then I had some friends who would say, hey, Charles, who killed a chief? And as I learned about that, that has kind of faded. You don't hear that much. But I still had a really good friend who would tease me. He went out to L.A. and, and got into the movies. But when he would call, he'd go, hey, Marsala, who killed a chief? And it was really meant that we know you Italians did it uh, as an insult to putting you down. And I um, started, re uh, I got fortunate I met a gentleman named Basil Russo. His sons are the Russo brothers who do the Marvel movies. So I was at the uh, convention and I saw they're starting to do these Italian independent film things. And I said, well, I'm going to do a film about Italians, Louis Prima and music and a few other guys I'm working on. And he said, I'm not interested. He says, make me a film about the massacre. And then I really got into it from there. For those who don't know what we're talking about, what, what is that phrase referring to? So, so it's sometimes called the lynching. It happened on March 14th, 1891. We just had the anniversary. The police chief was killed in 1890. The, uh, the quickly, the mayor blamed the Italian community. The only, the, he said the chief had said the word Dagos did it. But the only person that heard him was his bodyguard. And as I looked at this, I think the bodyguard's the guy that killed him. And then later, the bodyguard refused to testify. They got acquitted. The city council had given $10,000 to a committee appointed by the mayor to look into the Italian situation in New Orleans. They used the money to buy Winchester rifles. And when the Italians got acquitted, they broke into the jail and, and they shot nine of them and hung two of them. And that was the massacre. Then that set off a chain of events where the Italian council, the, the ambassador gets recalled, the president steps in, does retributions uh, to the families. He had some discretionary money. And then he creates Columbus Day. So that's this amazing story as we're fighting to keep Columbus Day right now. Few people know that it got started as a way of trying to get the Italians accepted nationally because we're having these problems in Boston, New York, and other cities. And that that's the massacre was uh, 1891, and it led to everything we have now. Yeah, the, I think the massacre is really shocking to me in part because it was the largest mob lynching in U.S. history, not talking about the largest government lynching, was obviously it was uh, it was like I think twenty five in indigenous, possibly I think Dakota men. I, I don't remember exactly. And obviously, you know, African Americans in the South, Black people in the South, were getting lynched at a much higher rate. But this was like the largest mass lynching, and it, it kind of stunned me to think, well, what's the vitriol against Italians? I'm like, Italians are as American as apple pie because I grew up in New York in the eighties, and I didn't know this world, <laughs> the world that my great grandparents, my grandparents existed in. So you find out about this. Tell me about people's reception to the work that you have been doing in this area. Um, have you had pushback from people? Have people been excited about this? Like, because I think it's kind of a mixed bag when you delve into negative history. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how how people have received it. Is. it. I have, I have now spoken in Savannah, Georgia, Chicago, New York, uh, a couple other places as well, because I'm connected. I'm part of the Conference of Presidents of Major Italian Organizations. So that's about 50 of us that I connect with, and they realize how important this story is. So this week, we've seen it nationally put out there. Uh, one of the things that was great was our mayor, uh, this Four years ago, Latoya Cantrell, I was asked to go ask her to do an official apology because the mayor had a role in that in 1891. As a city, really embrace the international fabric that is woven within this city that has made New Orleans truly who she is. So I am absolutely here today in my capacity as mayor of this city, speaking for the city of New Orleans in our entirety, I am here 
at this issue, in my opinion, is called for a formal apology. On March 14, 1891, 11 Italians were made the victims of a lynch mob on the street right here in the city of New Orleans. The city government at that time declined to seek justice for our people, and in fact, was implicated in the violence. That's why I'm here, and that's why I'm standing. This led to a rapture in Italian-American relations, and it was a serious very serious injustice. She was the first mayor out of 23, and this is in our video, that agreed to do that. So she did the apology that went worldwide. So suddenly we saw people wanting to know more about this massacre. And to your point, and you've done a great piece on this and other pieces as well, uh, the 5,000 was the size of the mob. And the mob was organized with the money that the city council gave this committee of 50. They ran ads trying to get people to hate Italians the Italians were starting to be a voting bloc that could determine elections. So one group was losing power, and then consequently, they were trying to keep power by getting diminishing the Italians. The Italians were starting to work the docks, and they were taking jobs away. So you also had the dock workers upset with the Italians. They were willing to work for less money because they, had, they were poor. So, so you had wage problems going on, and they wanted these Italians gone. They uh, One Italian had the contract for many uh, linear feet of the New Orleans dock. He was the, one of the guys that was killed. And the guy that led the mob got his contract within 30 days. I did and not know that history. His name is James Houston. And in my video, I tried to talk about James Houston. He was the one that led the mob. He ran the full page ad the day that they said, come, come meet at the Henry Clay statue, prepared for action. And they, they had all these Winchester rifles. They picked their best sharpshooters that they knew. So when they went to the jail, the mob stood outside and 60 guys with the Winchesters went inside to do the massacre. But they let some of the guys that it go. They only sh shot 11. There were 19 that were supposed to be tried. And one of the guys they went after was Macheka. Macheka okay. had the dock contract. Okay. And I didn't realize the dock contract. I didn't realize that part. It's just so damning. You know, <laughs> you see the layers of the history, which is why you can't, you need to kind of dig deep for some yeah. of this stuff. And James Houston, when I dug deep, I had to go through six books. Ten years earlier, he had actually killed three police officers on a election night because they were at the vote voting booths trying to stop his thugs from interfering with people voting. So he showed up and killed them and claimed self-defense and got off because his brother was a judge. Mm -hmm. So here you got a guy that's used to killing police officers. That's why I think he was involved in the killing of the chief. The chief had actually killed his main rival for the job ten years earlier as well. We had the brothel, okay, and it gets worse. We had the brothel situation going on in New Orleans. The chief owned part of a brothel, and he was shutting down other brothels that wouldn't pay him a fee. So you had maybe brothel owners that were mad at him. You had uh, people that from that were friends of the guy that he killed that would have been moving up the ranks that were maybe mad at him. You have the doc. I mean, all these people. So we made it almost like a who who done it type of movie. Right. Right. And I think it was so interesting because I mean, you're saying this, I'm thinking corruption, right? But what I grew up with the Italian, Southern Italian stereotype is like, well, Italians are corrupt because of the mob. And, uh, you know, I never really knew a lot about it until I sat down with my dad and he shared finding out that his his grandfather, after coming to the United States, was approached um, and, you know, thought about it and decided not to take that lifestyle path. Um, but there there a lot of the articles, primary sources I've read especially New Orleans, is Italians, Sicilians in particular, I'll say Sicilians in particular, they are so corrupt, like in, in, the, in, in that rhetoric about the mob. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And what did you know about the mob, the mob as a little boy? Or did was it not something that you knew about until later? You know, and, and, you know, and, and we have a connection here. Uh, there's a gentleman that was named Carlos Marcello, and he is reputed to have been involved in the mob. And then actually with the John F. Kennedy killing, and that fascinated the hell out of me. I actually went to Dallas and, and look, walked the grounds and went to the museum there about the JFK killing. You go to the mob museum in Las Vegas and there's a whole story there about Marcello. Wow. The movie JFK was made about it. And growing up, I was three years old when JFK was assassinated, uh, but there were still trials going on in New Orleans 
where they were trying to convict people for being involved in the conspiracy to kill JFK up until about 1968. So we saw, I saw the news about those trials. So I knew there was something going on here. And there was always that mystique about the mob. But, but also what I found out is the mob, and this goes back to Sicily, the mafia stands for Morta alla Francesca, Italy, Angeli, death to France, Italy cries. So the mafia got started to get France out of Sicily in the 12, around 1226. And then you have this group, the Sicilians were needing to defend themselves. So when they came over here, I've been, I'm told that if a Sicilian girl got, nobody cared. The police didn't do anything. DA didn't do anything. So the Sicilian men started becoming their own police force. And, and that is sort of how the mob story gets going on is that we were over here and nobody cared what happened to us. So the end, the end result is you formed your own civic association to protect your own people. Mm-hmm. And that, that's sort of how we get started. And, and, and now I, I, what I'm trying to do now is we've actually got 10 markers approved by the state of Louisiana telling of our contributions to New Orleans. And I can't get the city to let us put them up. So it's strange that the state has approved that they're accurate, but the city doesn't want our story told of some of the things that we did positive here. So I, I walk the streets and recently I see that the, the guides saying this is where the mob got started. This is that, but they don't talk about the, the positive things that we did. Mm. You're saying even now when people are taking like the walking tours. This was only a month ago. I was in front of what was an area called Little Palermo in New Orleans because there were so many people from Sicily there. Uh, and that uh, the, another little tidbit is Mother Cabrini was there. The Cabrini movie just came out. They won't let me put up a market at Cabrini in Cabrini Park. Wow. The first plane to cross the Atlantic was a guy that left Rome went to Africa, flew to Rio, up to Amazon, lands in New Orleans on the Mississippi River two months before Lindbergh. We can't put up a marker up for him. There's all these other things, uh, civil rights that the Italians did. Uh, Pascal Gallagaro was a big judge that did a great job with civil rights. They won't let us put up that marker. Uh, Tivoli Circle was the circle that was, they've renamed it. And that's after the town of Tivoli. And I asked if we could put up a marker there. All of these are state approved and the city council says no. So the mafia image keeps growing because that's all the the people are being taught in tour guide school. So I was also really interested finding out about the relationship, the very sweet relationship between these Sicilian immigrants and the freed men, the African-Americans in the South. And it wasn't, it wasn't always good, but it wasn't always bad either. It was a very, it's a really unique dynamic. And one of the things a lot of people have told me is that they, uh, people who identify as black, from Louisiana and that area have taken DNA tests. They've had a lot, a lot of Southern Italian DNA showing up, which is surprising because normally in those situations, if you think you're, uh, you know, have uh, had enslaved ancestors, you're going to probably have more like Northern European show up and from, you know, that. And, and to me, I think that's, that's probably hinting. And it was recent, the relationships that were happening in these areas that were not segregated covering some unique stories that, that I find that most people don't know about and your, your passion for them and your, your accuracy is amazing. I can always add a little bit of, of background because I've been able to please do really dig, dig, yeah. dig deep. Uh, a good example is, is you t- you told the story of the T- Tallulah lynching. What uh, I would add to that story is the Ital- Sicilians came over here with no animosity to African-Americans. And because they weren't part of the Civil War, they weren't part of everything that was going on. So they come over here. And in Tallulah, the deal was, if you were at that store, the uh, Fada store, and I actually ran into one of the descendants last night at our St. Joseph parade. Are you kidding me? That's amazing. And I'm serious. I just met the guy, and he tells me that his ancestor was in the lynching. And I'm thinking New Orleans. And he says, oh, no, the Tallulah lynching. Wow. Yeah. And I actually did go up when they put dedicated the markers in Vicksburg, where they buried the people. Uh, we got that marker put up four years ago, and I interviewed the, some of the descendants that had flown in for that event. So that story is that family, if you were in line to buy a, you know, rice or whatever at their grocery store, you were in line. And white people would come in saying, well, I get to get in front of the black person. And the Italians would say, no, you don't. So there was an animosity to the Sicilians and to Lula, to that store. So they were, besides the deal with the goat, you have the fact that they did not discriminate. Okay, there was no segregation going on in the Sicilian community. And I'm reading about Louis Prima because we're doing a lot, uh, Louis Armstrong, excuse me, a lot on music right now. Louis Armstrong uh, was playing at 
place is owned by Sicilians, the Matrangas, okay? And he lists this and he talks greatly about how they cared for his mother and everything else. So as I read things, uh, and the piece we're working on right now is on Cosmo Matassa, but this is 1940s. He's working with Dave Bartholomew, who's an African-American, and they're recording Fats Domino, Ray Charles, Little Richard, all at his studio. So there, there was the Sicilians did not have this segregation thing going on. They were violating it frequently, um, and it was maybe sometimes to their demise. So that that was part of what was happening. Now, that's just saying it was 100% that way, but clearly in music, for sure, and in other places, there was no uh, problems because I look at the neighborhood we lived in in Monroe, where, where little Italy was, it's right next to, to the African-American neighborhood. Um, and and it's so there was this mixture of the cultures from and it ended up in music and many other things. That's beautiful. And I uh, read this interview. I think it was maybe somebody's thesis paper for their PhD, but they were interviewing people in, in Shreveport and they were asking people with who were identified as Italian and Sicilian American about the desegregation experience. These are people who lived through that in schools. And one woman was just recollecting that to her, it was just like now she got to see her friends at school because she had grown up playing with the kids in the neighborhood who were considered black, but they were in adjoining neighborhoods. And still, though, in this circumstance, the Sicilians were considered white enough to go to school, whatever that means to the white school. But after desegregation, now she had her neighborhood friends with her in school. Yeah, but I would, I would love to hear more about your childhood experience. Because so we, uh, um, I would say once a month, we drove from New Orleans to Monroe. So my experience a lot is going back and the, the Italian club in Monroe, my grandfather was still very president of and my uncles became president of. They had to change the name during World War II because of the Mussolini issue. So it became the Progressive Men's Club. PMC. And we would we would have Easter egg hunts there. We'd have all these events there. And it, would, and it was all the Italian families, like maybe 300 family, excuse me, Italians would be there for these events. Because the Italians could not have access to any of the country clubs that have wedding receptions or any other events. So they had to have build their own building. That building doesn't exist anymore. They, they did sell it. So, so growing up, it was fun because we were hanging out with our own and you would show up and you would see your cousins and there were so many and we would have these great events. Uh, I was, I got to play Jesus on a St. Joseph altar one year. You know, it's like my aunt told, you know, said to the, her uncle that if, if you don't make Charles the Jesus, I'm not coming this year to Monroe. Okay. <laughs> so I got to, be, I got to be Jesus. It um, worked. <laughs> it worked. And that, that was, uh, so the, the altar, which we're having right now, it's, it's amazing that we're doing this interview, which is in the week of the lynching and the week of her altars, the week of Cabrini coming out. Um, we had a, a, a very good quality of life, not really sheltered in a way of not knowing. It wasn't until, like I said, the lights went on when my friend's mom said they don't let Italians do that because I had not known the limitations so much before. Uh, in my life of, of, of not of being Italian. I know we were teased a little bit. There were a few Italians at my high school and and we would get joked, but we kind of let it roll off our backs, not thinking a big thing about it. We we were at the time, Victor Scarrow had been mayor in the 1960s and he was from Contessa Antolina, which is one of my heritage towns. And so we were, um, felt we were accepted. And, and what's great is Mother Cabrini in the movie, it's, spoiler alert, She's in New York in that movie, and she tells the mayor, someday there's going to be an Italian in that seat. And I'm thinking that was our story. If you see that movie, it really is what was going on here. Uh, 1890, she was in New York and in New Orleans, opening up an orphanage, almost identical, where she gets a, a, you know, a place that's in a tough neighborhood and goes to a better facility, just like she does in New York. So growing up for me was uh, going back to this little place where we were safe. And it, it wasn't... Though I will say I was not part of, when I got to high school, I realized, though, I was not part of the uptown crowd of New Orleans, which is the people that did the lynching, and that became some of the, the more established Mardi Gras crews. So you didn't have access to some of those events. and But I didn't, wasn't a big deal in my life. However, later, I've now realized that that was going on. We created in the 1930s an Italian crew called the Virgilians, because we had no access to letting our the daughters be debutantes, so that they created the, the uh, Virgilian Society. Now, 
one of those crews rex which is was one of the heavily involved in that massacre some of their founders actually honored uh uh sienna last year in mardi gras and they invited the ambassador to italy in i'm 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 getting uh we got italian members in it there was an italian that was king last year of rex so things have evolved and a lot of that is is now under the water and we've kind of forgotten but but clearly from about 1920 to 1950 you would say that we had a hard time breaking in here yeah what would you say i mean i know you've been studying this for so long and you know so much but was there something along this journey that just kind of shocked you <laughs> like there's one that, because there's definitely been times where i'm researching and i come across something and i'm like i need to tell all of my family right now what i just found when the civil war started it really wasn't about slavery in my opinion you know we had tariffs we had some other issues going on lincoln doesn't say i'm ending slavery okay the war gets started he's losing he sends an ambassador over to italy because there was a guy named garibaldi who had just unified italy in 1861 in march so now we're into like october okay and they go find garibaldi because he was this great general he had lived in new york for a couple of years they said will you come back and be a general in the union army and he says if you make the war about ending slavery so a year later lincoln decides to do that and i feel like that's one strong thing that we have to think about is that garibaldi was known as a freedom fighter he fought in south america on this he said we're going to end slavery in america and then end it throughout the western hemisphere that was his offer to Lincoln that he would take the position if Lincoln would do that. The ambassador said, we're not in a position to do that. So Garibaldi refuses the, the offer of Lincoln to, to do that. Uh, another little tidbit there, as I found out, is um, a guy under Garibaldi was from New Orleans during those Italian wars. And his name was Wheat. So Wheat had fought in the Mexican-American War here. He's fighting as a mercenary under Garibaldi. They've got 12,000 Sicilian POWs now after the, in 1861. And he says, hey, there's a war breaking out in America. I want to go back. I'm going back. Can I take some of these POWs? And Garibaldi says, yeah, we won't have to feed them. We won't have to worry about them. Guerrilla tactics. We don't know what to do with them. Get them out of here. So 1,200 Sicilians leave Naples and come to New Orleans. And that's the beginning of the Tiger unit of the Confederacy that became the LSU Tigers. Wow, that's so wild. I did not know that. I I do now when you were talking about Garibaldi writing that letter back to Lincoln. I remember reading that a long time ago. That is something that I feel like needs to be in every American history book when we're talking about this stuff. And I'm just, I know not everything can fit in, um, but it has made me sad that, you know, growing up, my experience of, of uh, identifying um, with my dad's Italian heritage is I, I didn't know any of these people to be proud of. I didn't know that there was this, all of these heroes. You know what I mean? You, you have you have Columbus, um, who's kind of become, <laughs> he's become uh, more than a man, is standing in for all of the people that we should know that we don't know about. There's 15 books on Columbus back behind me right now. And I, I'll add this because I know this is a, a hot topic and this is some of the things i'm working on um columbus in my opinion is he an explorer or is he a conquistador and i'm and the more that i'm finding out i'm hoping to go to genoa in may and, and study him there a little bit more is that he's from genoa he doesn't get the italians to fund his trip he tried to get the british to do it so he ends up getting the spanish to do it well the spanish had just finished the war uh, of the reconquista war taking spain back from the muslims and they had all these soldiers so on his second voyage they send a lot of these soldiers with him he's really trying to get to india to uh try to take back jerusalem and hoping that the indian the people in india will help him uh take back jerusalem so he's looking for the passageway to get there he's really not worried about trying to do anything and uh, conquer the conquistadors come over cortez and all these other people and he is being blamed for those actions he was really out at sea the 12 years from his first voyage through his fourth voyage he actually had a one year where he was stranded in jamaica the ships fell apart and he was on an island for a year uh the other people were looking to do a story that explains all these other people that were really the spanish governors during his period that he's being blamed for because i think there's so much to talk about it, it with columbus mm -hmm. we have six thousand things in america named after him and he would be like the columbia space shuttle we had columbia was the name of the apollo rocket that landed on the moon the, the command module columbia was a ship that said disneyland that i'm going to go to next month to ride there's a ride in disneyland the columbia ship that came right after we became a country so 
you know, Columbia as a goddess before the Statue of Liberty was seen as what America was aspiring to be. And then this is something that's pretty neat that I did find. I think you'll find. So one of the things we have right now is to educate on, on the Columbus and Columbus Day reasons. And hopefully that we don't see that uh, day get lost. And we don't. And we're working now. The Native Americans, you talked about the uh, Dakota tribe. Mm -hmm. They have actually, our nation, excuse me. Well, uh, they have partnered with us to form the Native American Guardians Association. They want to see Columbus kept. They do not have an issue with Columbus. And we just formed that um, about a month ago. Wow. Uh, I was on a Zoom call with them. It was 10 of us from the Italian group, and there's three of them. They also are offended by calling it Indigenous People Day. They, they're Native Americans. They don't consider themselves Indigenous people, and they feel like they're losing their identity. They have a thing called Seven Generations. Yeah. They want to make sure that the seventh generation knows who they were, which is a beautiful thing. It is beautiful. I love. Yeah, I, I, I love that um because it's the process of like you're looking back enough to know what to pass on to the next generation what what do you think you want the next generation of i would say all americans to know about the italian experience here in the united states i, I would say you know we, we part of what we've been talking about is engineering i'm an engineer so there was marconi um and and Marucci, who invented you know wireless communications and all, that we don't we want to be known more for just pasta and wine. We did a lot of engineering work in America. We did a lot with government uh, work as well. We've had some great work with civil rights, like like Garibaldi saying, "Hey, this is wrong. The slavery you guys have." So we have done contributed so many ways to America that we need to to let that be known. And we would also hope to inspire more Italy trade because of, of the technology that Italy has. It's much more than just going over there to party and, and drink and eat. There's um, telemedicine and other things the Italians are doing. Clean energy are, are really earth shattering. So we're trying to tell that story that we are, we, we brought a lot and actually Ben Franklin used a lot of, um, gosh, I'm blacking up, uh, Phil and Jari. Yeah. He was a guy that, you know, you're nodding your head, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. He, he wrote a lot about how government should be equal rights, free speech, trial by jury. That was 17th century. So the influence of Italians in creating America's vision, which Columbia was, of what we're going to be of this country that's welcoming and we all and we aspire to great things and humanity. That's who I think we have to tell our story of what our culture is about. 